Before we start today's review and demo, I thought we would talk about a little current event first. Gibson is offering a $59,000 bounty to anybody who can find the original shipping ledgers of the bursts. We're talking the 58, the 59, and the 60s. Because when they moved from Kalamazoo down to Nashville, that's the one shipping ledger that just happened to disappear. I'm curious what you guys think about that bounty price, because you know, at first it's like, wow, $59,000. But if you think about it, he who owns the ledgers owns the counterfeit market of the bursts. <laughs> so maybe they should up that with another one at the front, 159,000. Who knows if they even exist anymore? They probably got burnt up in a house fire or something, got lost and just got trampled on the road. If somebody not nefarious owns it and they will find it because of this bounty hunt search, it's kind of cool that Gibson's putting up money to find the heritage of their most popular guitar. But hey, let's go ahead and learn about this. Welcome back Troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we're going to learn about the Gibson Custom Shop 60th Anniversary 1960 Les Paul Standard. Isn't that just a mouthful? Okay, so the Les Paul Burst, it's like the Les Paul that everybody wants, right? They made them from 1958 to 1960, and that's that first time that they used this whole sunburst finish type thing when they switched over from the gold tops. Now, originals, though, run you anywhere between 100,000 to, you know, 500,000 plus. It really depends on the top condition, if it's been refinished, if it's been broken, if it's been repaired. I mean, even re-necked examples will still bring 100,000 plus. So that just shows you just how valuable the these guys are. So when you can buy one of these reissues at six and a half thousand dollars, it sounds like a great deal, right? <laughs> But basically, Gibson has just been working their way through the 60th anniversary of these guys. So a few years ago, we had a limited edition run of R7s. We had the R8s, and then I just recently documented the 60th R9. I actually had the NAMM show piece for that review and demo, so definitely check that one out if you missed it. And this year, it's the ROs. And if you don't understand what I just said, the R stands for reissue, and then it shows you the year that you're reissuing. So R7, meaning 1957. R9, 1959, and RO, yeah, that one might confuse you. 1950? No, 1960. That's where we're at. So that means next year in 2021, we'll probably have a 60th anniversary 61 SG Les Paul. So now that we're up to speed there, last year with the R9s, they just did a whole bunch of finishes with those guys to celebrate that. But the 60s are kind of a little bit different because they get different specs depending on which neck profile you choose. These guys are divided into three categories. You've got the V1, V2, and V3. This one that we're starting with right now is a V1. This is just like a 59 reissue. In fact, it's pretty much the exact same guitar. And what that means is it has that pretty beefy neck. I mean, it's kind of an in-between, not quite as big as like an R7 baseball bat neck, but it's super rounded, fills your hands. This is the type of neck that I personally prefer. But the other things you got going for it are the golden bonnet knobs, as well as the single ring, single line Cluson style tuners. And everything else about this is just, you know, 1960s Les Paul specs. Maple top, mahogany back, mahogany neck, all the good stuff. But then you can move on to V2. This guy right here, you start to get brighter finishes on these guys. And the most important thing is the neck profile starts to slim down. So the V2s are kind of like the in-betweeners. This is actually a V3, so you can't really go based off of this. But the biggest thing that does start to change here is you get different knobs. Now, it might not sound like a big deal. So what? You got different knobs. But look at these things. These are called reflector knobs because of that reflective surface that they put on top that tells you volume from tone. But take a look at how metallic and gold those things are. They look so much better than the Gibson USA version. It seems strange to get all worked up over plastic knobs, but those are beautiful. So that's just a cosmetic change. Everything else is about the same, except for our tuners. So remember how I told you it was a single ring, single line tuner? Let me teach you Cluson talk if you're not familiar. Rings refers to the rings right here. You see how this one has one and two. So that means this is a double ringed Cluson. And then right here, you see how there's just one line? That means it is a single line Cluson. So you could technically have a double ring, double line Cluson, a single line, single ring Cluson, double ring, single line. I mean, it just kind of, you know, mix and match depends on what year that you're talking about. I know the 70s mainly have the double rings. 
So it's just a cosmetic difference. It probably doesn't mean a lot to most people, but for the diehard collectors, that is an attribute that they're looking for right away. And as you guessed it, once you get to the true V3 necks, this is the slimmest of the bunch. I mean, it's the super, super tiny stuff. I'm not a big fan of this neck profile. I prefer a little bit more meat on the bone for these, but you know, some people really dig these. But V2 and V3 have the same specs as far as plastics and tuners go. So besides that, it really just comes down to the colors. You get six colors in total, two for each neck profile, a deep cherry sunburst for V1 and antiquity burst. And this is an antiquity burst right here. It's kind of interesting. It's got a little bit of a dirty lemon vibe to it down here, but yet it has a little bit more red at the top. I and mean, this one kind of reminds me of that red eye Les Paul. The V2s feature a tomato soup burst, which was a Nam show favorite, as well as the orange lemon fade. Then for V3s, you get that really dark wash bourbon burst vibe. And then this one, wide tomato burst. It's that, you know, very iconic 1960, still has all the red within the finish type color. So there's something kind of for everybody in this run. Unfortunately, these 1960 reissues aren't proving to be quite as popular as the 59. It's just something about that number. People like the 59 reissues a little bit better. But when it comes to thin necks, the people that like those, they flock to these guitars. And here's something else cool about these guitars, the way that they're serializing them. They're actually putting these things in order. So like the first one would be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0001. And that's kind of why I chose this one. It's number 43, so that's very early in these runs. Whereas this other one's like 596. I think the highest serializations I've seen right now are about 900 or so. So they're probably going to make, you know, a good 2,000 some of these instruments. So having one within the first 50, that made me happy enough. But I think you guys get the gist, so let's go ahead and go into my first impressions on these. You know, it's a high-end Les Paul. It's gonna feel great, it's gonna sound great if you're looking for that reissue thing. So I don't think I can really, you know, review and knock them based off of anything like that. But let's talk about these colors. Besides the whole low serialization on this one, what I really fell in love with was the top on this one. It wasn't necessarily like what I would consider a monster top on Sweetwater's photos. It actually looked a little bit plain and it was that serial number that I was saying, get it, get it. But when I opened it, yes, I love tops like this. They're not too in your face, but yet they're very active in the light. And it's got that super kind of quilty kind of flame action going on here. And I love that. This guy kind of has a similar thing too. Certain angles it can look kind of dead, but then there's other angles where you're like, oh yes, I love that. This one doesn't do so good left to right. But when it's sitting in its case, there's certain angles where you just go, wow. <laughs> And the backs of these guys, they're nothing like the Gibson USA versions. They use like this super grain pore filler that turns that like a dark red. And then you get this redness right here. It really gives it an evil vibe to it. But now something that kind of lets me down on these things is the VOS finish. I'm not a big fan of that. It stands for vintage original spec. It's like a light aging compound is a way to briefly describe it. It just makes your hardware look a little bit dirty and it makes the finish not be like 100% super glossy. So it kind of feels like a guitar that's been used just a little bit, but it always just looks like somebody's sneezed on your pick guard bracket right there. It is possible to polish it off if it bugs you, but all of them are done up like that. But I do want to talk about QC issues on these guitars. I was surprised how much I could find just, you know, after the first couple of minutes of looking at these things, especially this V3. The truss rod cover on this one had some bleeding going on or it wasn't scraped properly. So Gibson's going to send me a replacement for this one because it just looks a little bit sloppy. Because you look at my other one and that's a nice crisp line. There's nothing that looks like a pen around it. Next up, the edges of this headstock, when they were buffing it out, they always have to be careful not to buff through the finish. And they got it on both corners of this one. Once you see it, you can't really unsee it. It's kind of unfortunate. And then we move to the sins of the V1. The only thing I really found on this guy is the pickup ring has been cracked. Though to be fair, that could have happened in shipping. But the other thing with this one 
is binding bleed. Binding bleed occurs because of the aniline dyes that they use to make these things. That's how they get this brilliant red cherry stain to it. And it gets the name binding bleed because it will bleed out onto the binding and kind of turn the edge of it red. This example right here is what I would consider about normal average binding bleed. You will have that. That's just part of having the historic Gibson finish on here. But this V1, I think they could have done a better job of making that not like turn the entire binding red. That was the very first thing that jumped out on me on this one. Had this one not have had a special serial number and a nice wood crane, I probably would have returned it. But you can even see that extreme bleeding on the edges of this one. So maybe that's something that Gibson could work on in the future. I'm not even sure how they would. I mean, do they have to leave it masked off for a long time? I mean, it'll eventually bleed out onto it anyways. And the other thing I'm noticing is the static buildup on these guitars. When you rub them around, you definitely feel it sticking to your shirt. So unfortunately, yeah, there's a few minor issues with these guys that come down to cosmetics. But I mean, as far as, you know, great playing Les Paul, they're definitely going to do the job once you plug them in. So let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside our 60th anniversary RO, just beautiful top on this guy once again. But there are a lot of surprises. Like first off, underneath the pick guard, you actually have that little red streak within it. Now what causes that is the old bursts when the sunlight would fade the rest of the red out of the guitar. Underneath there, it doesn't get as much sunlight. So that was kind of cool to see under there. That's a really nice feature. But as far as our pickups here, we have the Custom Bucker 3s, and these are unpotted, so that means they can potentially squeal, but that gives them that vintage sound to them. But they just have the patent applied for water slide decal, just like the original PAFs did. But inside here, you can see the long neck tenon. That's kind of the reason why you go for these historic guitars, because people like those. You can see they must have had some sort of masking tape over top of that when they had sprayed it. And while the routes themselves are pretty clean, the uh, top side of this had a little bit of wood spurs going on, so it's not the cleanest looking right there. But here you can see where the mahogany body joins to that maple top. So exactly what you would expect to see in a historic Les Paul. Oh man, that's really cool. Do you guys see that? That's a natural X formed in the wood grain. I think the nickname of this one has to be Treasure Burst. <laughs> oh man, I might have to keep this one now. <laughs> I love stuff like that. So here we go, ABR1 bridge. It just says Gibson ABR1. Not too much more to go off of that, except for, you know, it's drilled directly into the top as it would historically. Now the tailpiece is lightweight aluminum, so it weighs almost nothing. There's a whole tone debate on whether these things are the best or not. All I know is it's historic spec. Another thing that these guys got going for them is all the plastics are made of something called cellulose acetate. Then the inlays are actually made of the cellulose nitrate. So they basically just tried to make these plastics the exact same as the bursts would have. Now, whether it's exactly the same, yeah, I don't know, but here we go anyways. So the knobs on this one, as we learned earlier, they're a little bit different than the rest of them. They're not quite as brilliant in my opinion. I mean, they're still kind of cool. It just depends what kind of vibe you're going for. But these historic reflector knobs are really cool in my opinion. It's all down to that gold flake sparkle within them. Then we'll take a look at the pickguard itself. It's got that Gibson custom sticker. You can't take that off. It's not permanently on there or anything. I just think it's really cheesy the way they age those pickguard brackets. But oh well, it's a beautiful guitar anyways. So two-piece maple, mahogany back, moving on to that mahogany neck with a rosewood fretboard. This is pretty much the only spec that these guys do not have 100% correct. To a real burst is they use Indian rose, whereas the originals used Brazilian rosewood. But Brazilian is now highly protected. They I still do use it occasionally, but it definitely bumps up the price by about double whenever you have a true Brazilian board. But what the modern day historics do have closer to vintage original spec is they use hide glue to join the top, they use hide glue to join the neck. I mean, that's the big difference between these, and I think it's like, what, pre-2008 Les Paul historics? But you've got 22 medium jumbo frets, nothing too exciting there. Standard 12 inch radius on these guys, but let's go ahead and grab these neck dimensions here. Now for your viewing pleasure, I will compare this to the V3 here on the screen. So this one's 1.69 inches at the nut, and by the 12th we're looking at 2.07. First fret neck depth 0.91 on this one, and then we're at 0.98 by the 12th. So you can see the uh, visual differences with the numbers right there. 
And here's a visual comparison between the necks. So this is your V1 over here, and this is V3 over here. But moving on to the face of our headstock here, you can see your truss rod cavity right there. And here's what one of those nice looking truss rod covers look like. And you can see these guys actually have the Les Paul model silk screen up a little bit higher than normal. As far as pickup readings go, our bridge looks like about 7.8 and our neck pickup should be about the same. Perfect sevens, lucky streak, 777. Middle, just for fun, we're looking at 3.89. Now moving on to the back here. Again, we kind of talked about the whole aniline dye process, but on top of this just being a single piece mahogany, body they really spec this out for like the lightest weight ones that they can do so that's something you'll get a little bit over a USA version of one of these things so if you're a fan of no weight relief but still want a light guitar this is kind of the territory you have to tread but take a look at this wiring job that's beautiful you don't have any metal base plate you've got your deluxe bumblebee caps right here Gibson branded pots all wired up 50 style and in this little shelf right here, you can see it's marked RO for 1960 reissue. But your output jack uses a plastic jack plate that's very square. And then you've got a strap button right here, one up there, and then here's our toggle switch cavity. Now Gibson, since about 2014, has been using special medallions. And this particular one just reads 60th anniversary, 1960, 2020. Nice even round numbers. It's a little bit of a disappointment though, because the R9's got fake diamonds in them. And since it wasn't actually a real diamond, it didn't really cost him that much to put it on. So it's a little bit of a letdown. These guys did not get that, but these are done up by logos. And if you don't like it, there is a regular one in the case. And these guys do feature thin binding in the cutaway, but it's stained so dark, it's a little bit hard to see. Running up the back of the neck, lots of wood grain, but not too much else to talk about. But you got your tuners and our serial number. Would have been cooler to have 42, but hey, I'll take 43. As far as weight goes, this one is 8 pounds, 13.3 ounces. And El Tesoro, 8 pounds, 13.1. So let's go ahead and plug this one in and hear how it sounds. <laughs> So now that we know everything about the 60th ROs, what are my final thoughts on these things? I mean, can I really say anything? They're the highest end Les Paul that money can buy right now, except for like super fancy custom orders. So yeah, they're good guitars. We had a few minor cosmetic things, but honestly, if you're gonna get one of these things, you're getting it because they're fantastic playing guitars. Are they necessarily three times better than a Gibson USA Les Paul standard 50s or 60s? No, but if you're a snob and you like long neck tenons, vintage accurate finishes, all those little nitpicky details, they are a completely different beast, but they're both good. So just buy what you can afford because it's all in the hands anyways. I will say though that I started to prefer the V3 neck once I actually sat down and played these things. It kind of reminded me of like a Norlin era Les Paul custom because those guys are usually a little bit thinner, whereas this one's like that reissue thick. 
let's go ahead and do a black light test before we say goodbye. Now this is a little bit scary to see. Brand new knobs glow like they're vintage. It must have something to do with the type of plastic that they use on these or something. Or maybe they're actually aging them themselves. Who knows? That's kind of cool and scary at the same time. You definitely have to know your knobs outside of just looking if they glow if you're buying those vintage ones. Because, I mean, people will pay. Uh, I don't really remember. I think it's almost like a thousand bucks plus for original burst knobs. But it looks like the V1 style knobs also do glow. I don't remember the knobs glowing on that 59 60th anniversary, so that's kind of cool to see. But now let's go ahead and check out the cases because I finally solved the mystery thanks to my friend at the custom shop. All right, so on the outside, these things look about the same. I would argue this one is a little bit shinier, like it's a little bit more of a lacquered feel, but this is our earlier one here. As far as the latches go, these are looking the same to me as is the style of handle. But you're gonna notice when we open this, this is the one that we're kind of accustomed to seeing here. It's very minimally padded. It's got some padding, but not tons. They're going for the vintage historic correctness on these guys. You got the Lipton sticker right here. You've got a single compartment and it has your 60th anniversary certificate of authenticity. They just look like this. But it is a single neck rest, so not the most protective case in the world. But again, going for that whole vintage lift-in case thing. But you switch over to this one, and during the unboxing, if there was a second when I went, whoa, 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 that is a different lift-in case. So I reached out to my buddy at the custom shop and was like, hey, can you explain this? So apparently Gibson is trying to take these old Lifton styles and still keep them vintage accurate with the one neck rest, but they're trying to make them more protective because currently they're still putting these foam blocks inside to kind of help protect the headstock and shipment. They have these little bumpers here to secure the fit. I mean, again, that's all in the sake of historic correctness. So what they've done here is they actually given it a more bright pink color, which is kind of what the vintage Liftons look like anyways. So they're getting closer there. This is a little bit more plush. This neck rest is actually a little bit higher, I think. But I asked him, why are these not labeled Lifton anymore? Apparently, this little Lifton sticker will not attach to this fabric that they used. And they're having issues with the toggle switch poking through the top. I mean, you can see that right here, but you still had some of that on this case style anyways. So this was like a prototype run that they just kind of did. There's like 800 or so out there. So I guess we can continually watch to see what they do with the lift and reissue cases as they, you know, get towards more vintage accuracy and make it more secure because you notice this one doesn't actually have those blocks. But my buddy did tell me that they're actually gonna start using them again anyways. So just kind of a fun little trivia fact that'll be lost to time most likely. But here you can see all the case candy you got. If you buy it from Sweetwater, like I bought both of these from, you'll get this additional one. Kind of a little pre-packed checklist right here. You get the case keys. You get some of the vintage looking hang tags here with your serial number also on it. This is kind of an interesting one that I haven't seen before. I think, I think it's talking about the capacitors, your silica packet, the extra back plate if you wish to have that instead of the medallion. And again, just like that last one, it's a silver book and it says 60th anniversary and has your serial number on it. Troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed learning about the 60th anniversary ROs. I had a great time checking out both of these to get to feel the difference between a V1 and a V3 neck. As of recording this, the V1 is the only one that's available for sale, so you can check that link down in the description on Reverb. This was a new Guitar Day purchase, so if you're in the market for one of these brand new and want to get a slight deal on it, you can contact me through that program, which is available on my website. So thank you Troglodytes for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.